Hello everyone, this is David Wiley. I hope you're having a terrific conference and I'm genuinely sorry that I can't be there with you. But I thank you for the opportunity to still spend a little bit of time talking about open educational resources and about some of the research that we've been doing around open educational resources. Let me get right to it. Any presentation about OER should begin with the definition of OER. As you may know, open educational resources are any kind of teaching and learning material, like a textbook or a syllabus or a lesson plan. Uh, it's a teaching material that is free for anyone to access and includes free permission to engage in what I call the 4R activities. Those activities being uh, reusing, redistributing, revising, and remixing those educational materials. So anytime you have any kind of uh, teaching material or learning material, that you have access to for free and you have free permission to engage in these activities, you've got an open educational resource. Now there's lots of hype about open educational resources, about how they're going to save the world, about how students are going to save tons of money and they're going to learn so much more from OER. And I'm afraid that this hype isn't really productive. It's the, it's the type of hype that we unfortunately have in historically engaged in over and over again in educational technology. And for the last several years, I've been trying to dedicate my research to helping move us from this rhetoric over to specific concrete results, answering these questions about cost savings and about whether kids learn more or not in really rigorous uh, empirical ways. So as we've worked on that, we've developed what we call the KU re, uh, research framework. And this, is, we think, is a comprehensive framework for asking all the kinds of questions that we'd want to ask to be able to understand the practical impacts on people's lives of open educational resources. Now, KU, of course, is an acronym. It stands for cost savings, gains in student learning outcomes, patterns of use by teachers and learners, and also student and teacher perceptions of OER. And when you ask these questions, and you ask them and answer them in, in rigorous ways, uh, according to what we know to be uh, rules for carrying out quality research, then we can move from hype and rhetoric over into talking about ways that open educational resources really are or aren't blessing people's lives. So I want to give some examples uh, of research we've recently completed uh, in the context of this KU framework. First, looking at costs and outcomes in the context of the Utah Open Textbook Project. The Utah Open Textbook Project has been going on for three years now. It's touched about 6,000 students and 25 teachers. And what the Utah Open Textbook Project is is working in high school science classrooms and in schools and districts around Brigham Young University here. And we start with textbooks from ck12.org, the provider of openly licensed math and science high school textbooks. And we bring those textbooks to professional development activities over the summer with teachers where we get them together and talk to them about OER and about the power of OER and how OER means that you can take these textbooks and open them and change them and really customize them to meet your own needs in your own classroom. Uh, typically, these CK12, CK12 textbooks are very long and very comprehensive. <clears throat> Many of them are over a thousand pages long. But what we see is that our high school uh, science teachers, at the end of this activity, have winnowed these books down to 300 pages or 250 pages. So they're lean and focused and they cover just exactly what the teachers want them to cover and nothing more. <clears throat> and because in the schools that we've worked with, there hasn't been large access to laptop computers or tablets, uh, the overwhelming majority of the students who have used these books have used printed copies of these books. Um, this is an example, uh, the cover that we made for the, the biology textbook, and behind that you can see the text and some of the artwork that came from the CK12 books, which really are just terrific quality. Now, getting uh, that's context of the project. Getting to the cost part. A typical textbook that uh, one of these schools we worked with uh, would have purchased for high school science that cost about $80. And typically, these schools buy that textbook and hold on to it for seven years. So the amortized cost of that book per year is about $1142, $1143 per year. Importantly, though, with these uh, textbooks that cost so much that a district has to hold on to for so long, when you give that book to a student, the first thing you tell them is, now take this book, but no matter what you do, don't deface it in any way because six more students after you have to use this book. Now, deface, of course, in this context is a kind of code for don't highlight in this book, don't mark important passages in this book, don't or write or take any kinds of notes or draw things that your teacher drew on the board in this book. It's basically a hands-off experience for the student. 
Well, what we saw this past year, we just ordered and distributed about 3,000 books uh, to students participating in the, in the project uh, for the 2012-2013 school year. And our average cost to print and ship a book was just under $5. Now, these books uh, are very different in the way that students get to engage with them. Because when you buy a $5 book, you give it to a student and you tell him to keep it forever. Please highlight in it. Please write in it. Please make notes and do things that help you remember the important concepts that you read in this book. And so you can see that this annual cost is well more than half uh, for, an open, for a printed copy of an open textbook uh, compared to a printed copy of a traditional textbook. And of course, if you wanted to use the digital copy of the open textbook, uh, there is no printing and no shipping costs at all, and there would be a zero uh, in that far right column. So that's a little bit about the costs of the book. What, what about outcomes? We've been watching. Uh, the student scores on the CRT tests. Those are our state standardized tests in Utah. And this chart shows uh, the difference in scores in the years before teachers started using open textbooks and the year or years after they started using open textbooks. And what you see is an average uh, increase of just about 6%. So in other words, if the average teacher had 70% of her students proficient in chemistry in the years before she was using open textbooks, in the year or years after she started using open textbooks, that has moved up to about 76%. So in the case of the Utah Open Textbook Project, we see that we can save significant costs, more than 55% of the cost of textbooks, provide a book to every student that he or she gets to keep and forever and mark in and take notes in, and there are also moving learning outcomes uh, for students who are using these types of open textbooks. Now we've taken everything we learned about cost uh, in, in, these, in this multi-year study, and we've wrapped it up into this web page at opencontent.org slash calculator. Uh, each of the blue underlined links on this page, you can actually drag with your mouse to the left or to the right to turn the numbers up or down, and watch the column on the right-hand side move up and down, and watch the bottom line at the, at the end of the page show you how much money you will or won't save if you were to decide to use open textbooks. And this, this is just a really fun practical application. The research articles, of course, are important. But if you really want to know in your context with the kind of book and the number of students and the amount you currently spend, are you going to save money or not, here's a place where you can come to find that out. So that's an example of the kind of research we're doing in the cost and outcomes categories. How about use? I want to use a paper we recently published about uh, Flat World Knowledge as an example here. Flat World Knowledge is a uh, commercial provider, actually, of uh, higher education textbooks, textbooks written for uh, community college and university students. Uh, they're delivered online like this under a Creative Commons license, but you can also buy them in print, buy them in audio format, and in a variety of other ways. One of the things that Flat World Knowledge does with these books, because they're openly licensed, is they provide tools for faculty members to edit, change, revise, update, remix, revise the books, uh, and build custom books that they can use in their own classrooms. And we wondered, uh, I wonder what kind of uses faculty are making of this capability. Not only do the, does Flat World provide books with an open license, they provide a platform, uh, and they're storing information about all those changes, of course. So we wanted to get in and look and see how teachers were using these books before they ever got to the classroom. Um, now, there's quite a bit of data in this paper, and I've just pulled one uh, table from it. But this table, I, I think, is the most illustrative. Uh, you can see the customization type in the left-hand column there. We're looking at four types of customizations, things where faculty either deleted uh, words, pictures, or deleted entire chapters, uh, where they went and reordered chapters, you know, moved chapter three up to chapter two, uh, where they opened up a chapter and added new material to the chapter, putting a new picture in, dropping a video in, writing in a new example. And in this case, remixes in this paper we defined specifically to mean grabbing a chapter from another Flat World book and pulling it into the Flat World book that the uh, faculty member was customizing. And you can see on the right-hand column, of all the custom books that have been created, what percentage of those books contained each type of change? And uh, the thing we realized as we looked at this ordering of the uh, frequency of these changes is that the frequency of changes correlates directly to how easy it is in the user interface to make a kind of change. So to delete a chapter from a book is literally one click. And there are lots of custom books where chapters were just removed. To take a chapter and move it around and change its order also is a very small number of clicks. Uh, but to take and click into a chapter and start writing a new paragraph or to pull in uh, an image or a paragraph from Wikipedia or something like that, uh, 
It takes a lot more clicks and a lot more work and far fewer faculty engaged in that kind of activity. And because of the way the flat world system uh, was set up at the time of the study, it was actually very hard to pull chapters from other places into your book and very few people engaged in that uh, type of remix activity. So this is one of the examples uh, of the type of research we're talking about when we ask how are OER being used? How are they being used by teachers outside the classroom before uh, course the class even begins? But we'd also be interested in how do faculty use the OER materials inside the classroom? How are students using them in the classroom? How are students using them at home? Questions like that would also fall in the use category. And as a final example uh, in perceptions, I want to focus on Project Kaleidoscope. Project Kaleidoscope is a, uh, an initiative that includes eight community college and four-year schools stretching across the United States from west to east. Um, and Project Kaleidoscope basically begins with faculty members from several institutions, two or three institutions, getting together and aggregating open educational resources and pulling them together and combining something uh, that they can use in place of the textbook they'd used in the past. And in the Project Kaleidoscope context, every, every uh, institution that participated agreed to also adopt materials that they didn't participate in developing directly. So if teachers from community colleges A, B, and C got together and developed the textbook replacement for biology, faculty members from D, E, and F might have adopted those textbooks as well. So it's not just faculty uh, aggregating OER for themselves, it's aggregating for everybody who's participating uh, in the Project Kaleidoscope. In Academic 1112, uh, we had 11 courses that worked this way that touched about 9,000 students, although we were only able to formally research about 4,000 of those. Another 5,000 of those students were people who just got involved uh, indirectly, even though they weren't part of the project. So with the faculty and with the students that participated in Project Kaleidoscope, we did a number of surveys. Um, we, had about, we had over 50 teachers respond to the survey. And one of the questions we asked them was, compare the quality of this aggregation of OER materials to the quality of the publisher-provided textbooks you've used to teach this class in the past. And you can see here that the majority of people felt like the quality of the OER aggregation was about the same as the quality of the textbook that they'd used in the past. About a third of faculty felt like it was actually better quality than what they'd used in the past, and 11% of faculty felt like the OER were worse quality. So largely the same, although a big chunk also felt like the quality was better, um, and a small percentage feeling like the quality was worse. The chart doesn't change very much when we move to students and ask students, you know, compared to other textbooks you've used for other classes that you've taken, uh, how does the quality of this bunch of OER that you're using online compare to those textbooks? You know, again, over half say the quality is about the same. Almost 40% say they're better quality. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, less than 10% say that the textbooks are actually worse quality. So these are the kinds of questions that we'd ask to get at perceptions. You know, large-scale survey, over 500 students. Uh, in this case, um, over 50 teachers that were working with those students. Uh, asking them, tell us about the quality of this book. Ask us about the value of this book. We asked teachers, were your students more or less prepared? Uh, coming to class having used this book than they were in the past, and the results were very similar to, to the graph that's on the screen here. We asked students, imagine a course you're required to take in the future for which there are two sections offered, one that used textbooks, uh, uh, traditional textbooks like you've used in the past, and one that uses textbooks like uh, this class where they were online and they were openly licensed, and almost three quarters of students said that they'd prefer to sign up for the section that used OER. So trying to understand uh, not just the cost impact and not just the outcomes. Of course, if we could save a lot of money and improve outcomes, that would be great. But if by saving money and improving outcomes, everyone hated it, that would be bad. So understanding these perceptions uh, of teachers and students and other stakeholders uh, is important as well. So that's the coup framework in a nutshell. We're looking at cost, we're looking at outcomes, we're looking at use and perceptions. And we think that by really digging in in multiple contexts at multiple grade levels and across multiple subjects and trying to understand these questions, we can put some rigorous scientific footing underneath open educational resources. And we'd invite you please to participate. Uh, this is my email on the screen and the link at the bottom is a link to our research group where you can find the articles containing the data that was referenced in the presentation today. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a great time.